Hello, listeners. This is Kat. Welcome back to Put Your Hands Up Podfix. This will be the continuation of When Realities Collide. This will be Part 3, Chapter 3. Izuku watches wide-eyed as Katan stumbles away from him like he'd burned him instead of the other way around. Anxiety pits in his stomach, and dread just makes him feel sick as he stumbles back into Aizawa-sensei before he manages to find his bearings. Who? Katan breathes out desperately, like he can't manage to draw in a deep breath. He lifts a shaking finger and points directly at Izuku. Who the fuck is that? It probably shouldn't hurt as much as it does to hear Katan mutter those words accusingly, and it takes a good long second for Izuku to manage to drag himself around to the fact that this isn't his Bakugokatsuki, the one who bullied him throughout middle school and took it as a personal threat when Izuku managed to scrape his way into UA with All Might's help. This is the Bakugokatsuki, whose Midoriya Izuku is a villain. They're real, legitimate enemies here. Izuku doesn't know what the hell happened between them, what Deku did to Katan to warrant a reaction like that, but it makes him nervous. The way Katan is looking at him makes him wish the ground would crack open and swallow him whole. Katan has looked at him with a lot of emotions over the years, anger tending to be a recurring one, but he's never looked at Izuku genuinely afraid. Izuku takes a small step back, hardly aware of the fact he's now completely pressing back against Aizawa-sensei, who is... He's not Izuku's Aizawa-sensei. A hand settles on his shoulder, and he hates the way he startles. He hears a second splatter of liquid hitting the floor and swirls around when his brain catches up to the fact more of Sensei's coffee is spilled because of him. Oh, Izuku cries out. I'm so sorry, your coffee, Sensei. He has half a mind to tear himself away from Aizawa Sensei and force himself deeper into the classroom, but the other half of his mind wants him to turn tail and dodge around the man so he can disappear from sight. Neither of those things are smart. 1A is now watching him like he's a mix of some advanced puzzle, but also a threat that needs to be studied and monitored due to Katan's reaction. And after the reaction of the teachers in the office just now, he knows anyone who has seen or even heard of Deku won't hesitate to detain him by whatever means necessary. He's in a hero school. He knows a lot of the quirks currently attending the school this year, assuming that things aren't different like his class wasn't. There are some cool quirks, definitely, but they're all terrifying to think about when he thinks about them being used against him. He's scared. There is no lesser evil in this situation, and his life right now is genuinely in Aizawa Sensei's hands. Sensei, Katan barks out, taking another step away. Who the hell is that? Aizawa Sensei is quiet for a second, taking in the scene. He looks between Katan and Izuku himself before glancing out at the class. They're all quiet, watching and studying trying to figure out what it is they're looking at. Who do you think it is? Aizawa finally speaks, ushering Izuku into the room. Katan takes a quick step back, as Izuku is all but guided into the room. He thinks briefly about digging his heels into the ground and putting up resistance, but he doesn't dare. And unless he uses one for all to his advantage, and this isn't really a one-for-all type of situation, Aizawa-sensei is stronger than him. Aizawa-sensei sets his mug down on the desk when they're close enough, then dries his red, almost blistering fingers, dry on his hero uniform. When he looks up, he glances past Izuku at the students remaining in their seat before his attention tips back to Katan. Sensei looks thoughtfully between Izuku and Katan for a long second before he finally gestures to Izuku at his side, without taking his eyes off of Katan. Who is this, Bakugo? That's... Katan starts before he snaps his mouth shut, glaring at Izuku. The teen in question tries not to move, staying statue stiff at the underground hero's side. I don't know who that is, Katan snaps. That, that's not Midori Izuku. It's not him, but it, it's, what the fucking hell is going on here? That looks like, but he, he's not Deku. How do you know that? Are you saying it is Deku? Katan snarls, red eyes locking on the pro as his lips curl into a scowl. That's pretty fucking messed up, Sensei, if you're bringing Deku into the school. Whispers fill the heavy silence as the students talk. It's apparently now starting to sink in just who Izuku is, or who they believe he is. A quick glare from Aizawa-sensei has them quieting instantly, before the teacher's attention is back on Kachan. I'm not confirming nor denying anything, Bakugo. Is it, or isn't it, Deku? You said it's not, and you're the one who met him, aren't you? Which is it? Izuku doesn't know what's happening now. Why is Sensei not confirming that Izuku is not the Deku they know? Why isn't he telling Katan that he's right and that Izuku is not their Deku? What is the pro up to? What's he after? That's not the Deku I know, 
the ashen-haired teen grits out. Who the fuck is that? Midoriya Izuku. Aizawa sensei introduces calmly, still watching in interest as Katan doesn't dare to draw his attention away from Izuku. But you already know that. Katan stills, eyes narrowed on Izuku. No shit, sensei, but who the hell is he? That's not Midoriya Izuku, that's not Deku. Deku hasn't been... Not since. He's not... That's not him. So who the hell is he? Katan... Do not fucking call me that. Katan lashes out, pointing a now accusatory finger at Izuku. His lips are still pressed in the scowl, and his eyes are quick to jump from a scolded Izuku back to Aizawa Sensei. Who the hell is he? What the hell is he doing here? Just as I said earlier, Sensei huffs calmly. He's a personal student who will be shadowing me for the unforeseeable future. He's a guest here, so treat him accordingly, no matter what you think you know about him. Stop towing around this, Sensei! Kachan finally decides to throw caution to the wind, marching around the desk to stop squarely in front of Izuku. He pokes his finger against Izuku's chest hard enough that the green-haired teen is sure it'll leave a bruise. I don't know who the fuck you are, but if you touch a single one of my asshole extra classmates, I will blow you to fucking pieces, you hear me, imposter? N now you sound like my Kachan. Um, sorta. Izuku gives a nervous laugh, subtly shifting away. It's refreshing not hearing the telltale sounds of sparks coming from Kachan's hands. Maybe this Kachan fears Aizawa Sensei a little more than Izuku's does. I've never heard you defend our classmates. I wonder what's changed here. The fuck do you mean, my Kachan? Kachan fumes, but he doesn't step away from Izuku again. And, uh, what's this about our classmates? Ashido asks with a frown. Uh, oh, I, um, I just... Midoriya was hit by a quirk. Aizawa Sensei finally offers, instantly quieting his class with nothing but his words. A quirk in his reality, which somehow sent him here to our reality. He's not the villain known as Deku. He's a student who attends this school and is in my class, your class, where he's from. I understand this is a lot to take in, but trust me as your teacher that I wouldn't do anything that could possibly harm you students. Midori is safe, and we're sure of that. Um, Kaminari raises his hand, but doesn't bother waiting to be called on. Seriously? Because that sounds so cool. Alternate realities, that's like... Something out of a comic book or something. Izuku isn't sure cool is what he'd settle for when describing this whole mess, but the thought, in theory, definitely does sound sort of cool. Maybe not when it's happening to you, but looking from the outside. Wait, Kirishima straightens up. Does that mean there's two Dekus here now? That seems to be the most plausible case. Aizawa Sensei shrugs. But we can't know for sure. Deku sticks to the shadows. So we can't know for sure whether or not he's still in our universe. A quirk that swaps two people in two different points in two different worlds is practically unheard of, but then again, so is a quirk that sends someone to a reality they don't belong in. That's wild! Kaminari flops back against his backrest, similarly to how he is when he's short-circuited. Izuku thinks Sensei might have just blown his mind. Aizawa Sensei! Ida raises his hand. He waits in the impatient, patient sort of way until Aizawa Sensei glances over with a raised eyebrow. The idea of alternate realities is nothing more than a theory. How can you be sure that this isn't really Deku? How do you know this isn't a trick? He's a villain. Midori has been cleared by both Principal Nesu and Detective Tsukuchi, whom most of you were interviewed by after the USJ attack. Some of you might remember his quirk, which is lie detector. All you students need to know is that Midori was arrested, detained, and interviewed under the suspicion that he was Deku. We followed protocol as we would with any villain. But he's since been released. The man pauses, sipping at his coffee whilst looking exhausted. He scans the class thoughtfully before clearing his throat and continuing. Nezu, Tsukuchi, and myself all determined that he most certainly is not Deku after that interview. Midori has also provided evidence that is not of this reality, and ignoring all those facts would be illogical. Deku is good at what he does, I'm sure we can all agree on that. But he's not that good. Even so, Yayorozu shifts uncertainly, glancing quickly at Izuka before averting her gaze. Are you sure we should be trusting him? If I'm understanding this right, he's still Midori Izuku, Deku. What makes them different from reality to reality? That's not Deku. Katan finally steps away. Izuku lets out a puff of air when he's no longer pinned in place by Katan's tense frame. You extras are wasting your breath. I know Deku. And this guy isn't him. I mean... Kirishima sits up straight as Katan returns to his seat with a grim expression. Bakubro is... The only one of us who have actually met Deku, right? We should probably trust him. 
And Sensei, too. Sensei almost died for us at the USJ. You guys really think he'd bring a villain to class? Since when is Bakugo the trusted judge of character? Izuka's attention snaps to the voice he's not familiar with, grin widening when he spots who it is that took his place. He's the same guy who refers to all of us as extras. Shinso! Izuku beamed, startling not just Shinso himself, but the class and Aizawa sensei. I didn't think you'd be here. That's awesome. I'm so glad you made it into 1A. I know how much you wanted to get into this class, or, well, you didn't, um, my reality just... Wait, you know me? Shinzo looks torn between cautious, impressed, and a bit afraid. That's terrifying. I... Oh, uh, sorry? I just, um, I know all of you. Izuku swallows hard. I mean, n not you guys directly, obviously, because, um, we've never met here, but, uh, in my reality, you're my classmates, too, and we've, um, fought together, like, a lot, like at the USJ, and, um, Todoroki Ida and I fought, w well... Um, and then, at the training camp, and rescuing Katan from the League of Villains, we all had to work together. Izuku finds himself quieting in volume as he continues. He can't quite place the look on his classmates' faces, drawn between multiple different emotions at once on each different classmate. Sorry, Izuku winces. I know that's probably c creepy to you guys, but it's just we're all classmates where I'm from, so, um... You rescued me. Katan is the one to break the silence staring intently at Izuku. Once again, Izuku can't place the emotion on Katan's face. It's not angry, but he still can't. It doesn't look like it belongs there, whatever it is. Y yeah Izuku swallows again, nervously wringing his fingers together. Kirishima, Todoroki, Ida, Yayorozu, and I all banded together to rescue you from Shigaraki and the League. Um, there was a tracker that Yayorozu made and had stuck to the Nomu during the summer camp attack, so we followed it to you, sort of. Izuku pauses, blinking twice as he mentally runs through the rescue mission. I mean, it wasn't that easy, of course. You weren't even at the warehouse when we got there, but we did get you in the end. Um, uh, Aizawa Sensei was not, um, not happy. Izuku can almost feel Aizawa Sensei's eyes boring into him. That calculating and disapproving look, something in the way he is staring, tells Izuku that there probably wasn't a rescue party for Katan here, and if there was, it was nothing like the one Izuku's talking about. Wait. Kirishima's tensed up now. How did... How do you know we plan to... Red eyes shoot to where Aizawa-sensei is now glowering in Kirishima's direction. I mean, uh... Not that we plan to do anything involving rescuing Bakugo, because, uh, you know what? Never mind. For, Forget I said anything. Izuku blinks at Kirishima before glancing back at where Aizawa-sensei looks done with the day already. You're the reason they targeted me. What? Izuku yelps in surprise, eyes shooting towards Kachan. What do you... What does that mean, Kachan? Why would... Why... You're the one who convinced them that I could be bribed into joining their stupid villain gang. Firepower, whatever bullshit you had in your stupid head. You told me so yourself. If I can be a villain, Bakugo Katsuki, then so can you. You're the most villainous person I've ever known. Are you really cut out for heroics? Kachan sneers, mimicking someone else's voice. First time I see you after you... Katan grits his teeth, looking away sharply as he continues without finishing the thought. That's the bullshit you say. If I haven't been chained to a chair, I probably would have killed you. You changed, and it's fucking bullshit. I'm supposed to be the asshole, not you. Izuka feels sick, as that settles in his stomach. He'd done that. He'd wanted to convince Katan to join the villains. Izuka knew Katan was rough around the edges, but he still strongly believed he'd be a great hero. To know he'd tried to... It made his stomach coil. I'm sorry. Don't apologize for someone else's actions. Aizawa sensei snaps under his breath, and Izuku's the only one who startles, so he thinks he's the only one to hear the man. He bows his head, like a scolded child anyways. Wait, so... If that's not how your Bakugo got kidnapped in your reality, then how did the villains decide to kidnap him? Ojiro asks carefully. Did they randomly select him, or was there a reason? Oh. Izuku bites his lip. Well... My Kachan is... He is fiery. That's a nice way to say he's an asshole. Saro mutters under his breath to Jiro, who snickers behind her hand. Kachan snaps a glare at the two of them, but doesn't lash out. Weird. And, um, strong-willed. He said some things during the festival that sort of made him come off like an, um, asshole, I guess. But, um, I think what really caught Shigaraki's eye was the medal ceremony. Kachan was angry, and, um... 
Didn't feel like he quite deserved his win because during the last fight against Todoroki, he didn't think Todoroki gave it his all like when he fought me, so to get him up onto the podium, the teachers... They sort of muzzled and restrained him so he could receive his first place medal. They muzzled him on live television. Sensei sounds genuinely disgusted. Who the hell approved that? Because I hope to God it wasn't me. I... I don't know, Izuku squeaks, turning to look at where the man is leaning on his arms against the desk. I, um, I only saw it later, after the festival was over. I was having surgery on my arms during the awarding ceremony, and... You were having surgery on your arms? Sensei's voice sounds deadly serious, and Izuku has an uncomfortable feeling that he's unknowingly digging himself a grave. During the sports festival, we let you use your quirk at a school event until you needed surgery. Well, Izuku sucks on his bottom lip in an attempt to organize his thoughts and these specific events. I, I was still, um, figuring out my quirk, so I hurt myself a bit, and I also sort of went too hard trying to convince Todoroki-kun to use his fireside, a and he did, and I just don't think I was quite prepared for him to go, um, full force. I use my fireside. Todoroki chimes in from the back of the room, cocking his head curiously. I don't. Oh, um, Izuku feels so lost. You did? I think it was the first time in a long time, but you use it more often now. B but that's why Katam was so upset, because you used your ice and fire when fighting me, but you resorted back to just your ice when you fought him. It's starting to feel like he can't think clearly. It's that kind of loss that rattles your brain around and makes it hard to think about anything. He doesn't even feel like he could walk in a straight line right now, with how his head is spinning. Things are so different. They're the same, but they're not. These events happened, but not like they did here. And he can't help but let these two realities meld together in a way. Things that didn't happen to him feel like they did, and things that did happen to him feel like they shouldn't have, because he's the only one who knows about them. Someone with his name and face, essentially him, has been now terrorizing heroes, and Izuka doesn't understand why. He'd never in a million years do that. He idolizes heroes. Heroes are good. They help people, like All Might and Aizawa Sensei have helped him. Why would this reality's Midori Izuku turn evil? Become a villain? What happened? What changed? Hang on a fucking second. Kachan's glaring again. You used a quirk to the point you needed surgery where you're from? What the fuck? Izuku gives a nod, knowing that to be true. He's still got the scars on his arms, and he still hangs on to Recovery Girl's grave threat and warning that occasionally haunt his dreams. Kachan glares harder. Deku's quirkless. Oh, right. Not his Kachan. The Midori Izuku in this reality is still quirkless if All Might didn't give him one for all. He knows Deku here doesn't have one for all because according to Nezu and the detective, as far as Izuku's deciphered, All Might has been focusing on his successor. He's curious who the successor is in this reality, if it's not Izuku himself. I manifested a quirk, Izuku offers quietly. During the entrance exam for UA, I'm a late bloomer. There's a pause. Sensei. Asui raises her hand, but doesn't wait to be called on, either. Does that mean Deku's going to manifest a quirk here, too, Karo? No. Aizawa shakes his head firmly. I doubt it. If Deku was going to manifest a quirk, he would have around the same time Midoriya did. From what we know thus far, generally everything is roughly the same from reality to reality, quirks included. Midoriya has confirmed this multiple times. As for what we do know, Deku is diagnosed quirkless and won't be getting a quirk. We've seen his hospital records from before he became a villain. He won't be getting a quirk by any biological means. Izuku bites his lip, wiggling his toes and his shoes. He knows his records match up with Deku's. He's also biologically quirkless, so he's incredibly glad all his information is in his reality, and that it's not being questioned by his peers. That would be an awful lot of explaining he'd need to do to his Aizawa sensei. One for all it is clearly a secret here, too. If the hush-hush way the detective and principal had skirted around the topic was any indication, and not to mention how Izuku's possession of his All Might's quirk had been the factor that finally seemed to convince the two men of his innocence. Plus, he's positive if a Deku doppelganger spilled All Might's secret after Deku himself had already ruined his career, Izuku's not sure All Might would be very happy. From what he's gathered, All Might is already not very happy with him, which sorta of hurts to know. But how can one Midoriya have a quirk and not the other? Aren't they the same person, just in different realities? Uraraka asks, without raising a hand. She's glancing calculatingly at Izuku, thoughtfully watching him. 
I don't understand. I don't know, Sensei shrugs, glancing sideways at Izuku in a thoughtful sort of way. I'd agree with you, but I know for certain Midori has a quirk, I've seen it, and I also know Deku doesn't have one. If he had a quirk at his disposal, he would have used it by now. If Deku did have a quirk at this point, he'd be a lot more dangerous and he'd know that. He'd want the world to know that. Villains like Deku thrive on fear. But sir, Ida's hand shoots up, and Aizawa Sensei cocks his head as an invitation for the engine quirk team to continue. If that's the case, how are we supposed to trust Midoriya? Where does quirk come from? I agree with Araraka. If one Midoriya is diagnosed quirkless, shouldn't the other be too? Midoriya has a quirk. Aren't we being a little too trusting? No. Sensei huffs, arms crossing over his chest. We know virtually nothing about the quirk that sent Midori here. And we know even less about his reality, so I can't tell you why one has a quirk and the other doesn't. Reality travel is a foreign concept, and we can't begin to understand it without more information that we have zero access to. What matters here is that Midori has proven his position in his reality, not just with providing information that is parallel to ours, but with an ID card that was on his person when he arrived. But Sensei... Aizawa Sensei snaps his attention to Yayorozu, who instantly cuts herself off at his sharp look, before he glares around the room. Midoriya's not on trial, and he certainly wouldn't be on trial by students. All you need to know is that Midoriya has been cleared by three pro heroes and a lie detector quirk, who have met, spoken to, and determined that Midoriya is not Deku. End of story. There's no longer any question of if his story is viable or not. He's been cleared. The silence is so quiet, it's almost loud to Izuku's ears. He hates this. He hates the looks they're shooting him, and sure, he is not being attacked anymore, but he'd almost prefer it to this. Sensei heaves a sigh, rubbing at his eyes with his thumb and middle finger. Look. The man calls attention, hand falling to cross over his chest. We might not understand everything right now, but we understand enough to make a logical decision regarding Midoriya's well-being. There are going to be quirks in this world that you won't understand. That's just how this world works. Midoriya is innocent. Deku is not. Now, for the time being, he's under UA protection, and he will be my personal student. I highly suggest you all keep that in mind. That makes sense. Kirishima scratches at his head. I think. It's still scary, though, Hagakure offers cautiously. I mean, he is Deku, isn't he? He's not. Caught on the fence before Aizawa Sensei can even open his mouth. You extras are thick skulled. That's not Deku. And if any of you met the real Deku, you'd agree. You're taking this awfully personally, Ashido calls accusingly from across the room. What's the deal with that? You buddy buddy with Midoriya already, Kachan. Shut the fuck up, raccoon eyes. Kachan grits out dangerously, but doesn't bother adding anything else. The ashy haired teen turns away abruptly, ignoring the questions entirely as he glares out the window. Izuku watches his childhood friend with a frown. Enough, Sensei snaps. All of you. There's a moment of tense silence, everyone glancing around the room, looking at their friends to try and determine how everyone's feeling about the situation. Izuku feels a lot of eyes on him, but he doesn't dare look up. It's uncomfortable. It feels like he's under a microscope, and 1A is dissecting him apart. Soon the silence lifts to low mutters and mumbles as the students chat amongst themselves, still glancing at Izuku every so often. It hurt more than he'd care to admit that they're clearly waiting for him to lash out or to try to harm him in some way. He can't help but feel the tug of longing that he's not a part of it. This isn't his class, even if it is. He should be sitting over in seat 18, chatting and theorizing with his classmates. He misses his class. Quiet, Aizawa Sensei calls from the front of the room after kindly letting them chat for a few minutes. He sounds tired, but his voice is clear and final, instantly drawing in everyone's attention, Izuku included. The man lets the silence ring for a, a second, before finally speaking. Listen to me now. None of you have to trust Midoriya. That's not what this is about. I can't and won't force you to. That decision is entirely yours. But know that I do trust him. I get this is hard to believe. You have a right to feel the way you feel in this situation. There's no right or wrong way to feel about something like this. However, that doesn't give you any right to take your frustrations or fear out of Midoriya. I know nothing's happened yet. This is merely a warning to all of you. He is not Deku. They are not the same. For the time being, he will be sitting in on all of my classes. That includes homeroom and heroics training. Midoriya will be around, and there will be consequences 
if I hear of any of you treating Midoriya any differently than you would your peers. S Sensei, Izuku turns to look at him, nervously wringing his hands together. It's okay, I... I... No. Aizawa Sensei frowns. It's not okay. This is a class of pro-hero trainees, and if they can't treat an innocent individual who looks like someone they don't like with respect, they have no place in my class. You are not Deku, Midoriya. You won't be treated as a villain when you're not, and I'll make sure of it. Izuka stutters through his own thoughts, glancing nervously around the room. They all look fairly conflicted now, and Izuku hates that he's the one doing it. This is awful for them. He's a villain here, and Aizawa Sensei is asking them, heroes in training, to ignore the fact and treat him like a normal person. It sounds ridiculous. Here's the deal. Sensei continues to the class, arms crossing over his chest. If you don't like or trust Midoriya, avoid him. It's simple. He won't be seeking you out. And if you want nothing to do with him, that's fine. If you're curious, ask him questions. He'll be shadowing me whether you like it or not, because this is the safest place for him. Aizawa Sensei draws in a breath, finally coming out from behind his desk and standing beside Izuku. His voice is curled with understanding. You're all afraid of Deku, and you should be. It's rational, with what we've seen and know of the villain. He is a threat, but remember that if Deku gets word that he's here, Midoriya is a target. He's a sitting duck in this world, and he'll be in danger just as much as any of us. The bell rings, and Izuka's surprised by how fast homeroom went. If their schedule's the same in both realities, the class will be heading to math with Ectoplasm Sensei now. Aizawa Sensei leans against his podium, eyeing his students. They all remain seated despite the bell. It would be stupid to dismiss themselves, especially in Aizawa Sensei's class. Izuka's own class had only done it once, and they'd paid the price in terms of running suicide sprints, lots and lots of running. Please keep this quiet for now, he says to the class, and everyone seems a little surprised at Aizawa Sensei using please. This is a hero school, and Deku has a lot of enemies. Midoriya doesn't. I'm not asking you to not say anything. You're welcome to talk amongst yourselves. I encourage it, actually. Bottling things up does harm. So don't feel like you have to, but try to keep it confidential within the class. I will stop by the dorm common area after classes today, and you're welcome to bring up any questions or concerns at that point. Izuku bows his head and avoids looking at everyone. He can feel them staring. He knows he has everyone's eyes on him, and it just makes his skin buzz with nerves. He wonders if it's clicked yet, that he'll be staying up in the apartment over the dorms with Aizawa Sensei and Present Mike. If they even know Present Mike lives there, too. You'll have enough time to make it to Ectoplasm's class before the bell, so don't dawdle. Aizawa Sensei heaves a sigh. And just as a reminder, I will not be your teacher for heroics this afternoon. You'll have Vlad King and All Might guiding class, and you'll be working with Class 1B on simulation exercises. Dismissed. The students stand slowly and are quick to gather their belongings. Izuku keeps his gaze ducked until Sensei continues, loudly. Bakugo, you're with me for first period. Someone tell Ectoplasm that I have him. If he has questions, tell him to email me. There are a couple mumbled yes senseis as well as Ida promising to pass on the message, Aizawa Sensei watches them leave without saying anything else. When it's just the three of them left alone in the room, the underground hero calls their attention by clearing his throat. I think there's a lot the three of us have to discuss after what just transpired. Katan glares, but Izuku just swallows nervously. Oh no. Shota can't say he expected homeroom to turn out quite like it did. He'd expected hesitance and concern, fear. He had expected that the students would react similarly to the teachers, but he'd known that he has more control over the students than he does the teachers. He knows some of his students had seen Deku at the USJ before he'd pulled his Houdini act and disappeared without a trace, leaving a mess of destruction behind him. He knows that they'd gotten peeks at his face from afar, so it wasn't unrealistic for any of them to be able to ID him. He just hadn't expected anything to happen so fast. In hindsight, he probably shouldn't have let the fact Bakugo had met Deku previously slip his mind. But in forgetting it had raised some very disturbing red flags. There was obviously some sort of connection between the two, not just Midoriya with his Bakugo and his reality. The cute, childlike nickname of Kachan that Midoriya had called him was hard to ignore, and Bakugo's recollection and reaction to the name was interesting. Midoriya's name for his own Bakugo had showed his Bakugo recoiling as if it was familiar. Odd. And it wasn't like Bakugo was hearing the name for the first time, miffed and disgusted at a Deku lookalike calling him some cutesy foreign pet name. That was a reaction of someone who hadn't heard that specific nickname in ages. 
like when Hizachi decides to be an asshole and call him Shochan, with the sole intention of getting a rise out of him, which does always get on his nerves. What a stupid nickname. But that's beside the point. It was fear and hesitance all rolled into one snide scowl. Shota hasn't known these children for much more than a couple of months at this point, but that's more than enough time to determine their personalities and characters. To pick them apart and come to the conclusions of what he needs to do to help them and what he needs to keep an eye on. Bakugo had always been a wild card, since that very first day. There weren't any acts of aggression or violence he'd seen, nor was there anything on his previous school records that were cause for concern. He'd never done anything over the top concerning in class, besides his sometimes quite hostile attitude, at least, but there was just something about his character, his demeanor, that had Shota keeping a closer eye on him. There was familiarity in how he regarded Midoriya, how he'd looked at Midoriya and had been able to spot the difference between Deku and Midoriya with nothing more than the green-haired teen saying no more than ten words. There was more to this. He's missing something. Not just in Midoriya's reality, but theirs as well. He leads the two teen boys through the school, pausing outside the teacher's office and opening the door just enough to peek in and confirm that it's empty. He knows only himself and Hound Dog have first period free and Hound Dog usually has business to attend to in the guidance office. Satisfied that the room is empty, Shota holds the door open for the two boys to enter. Midoriya walks quick, nervous feet, whereas Bakugo is dragging his feet, eyes narrowed and unwavering on Midoriya. There is a conference room that Nezu likes to use hidden away in the back of the office, and Shota suspects that the soundproof interior is probably the best place to have this conversation. He doesn't quite know what will come from this, but he has a bad feeling that Bakugo knows more than he'd let on. It had been about a month since the boy had been rescued from the League. They'd never really stopped to think about how Bakugo would come out of his time in the League's custody with Deku's civilian name, when no one had even heard whispers of it prior. Thinking about it now, it seems convenient. Not in the way that Shota thinks Bakugo had any hand in anything, but in the way that maybe, maybe the kid isn't telling them the whole truth. Shota will admit he was more focused on getting Bakugo to safety than thinking about the name the teen had muttered under his breath when he'd finally been rescued. His priority was tending to a student who had spent three days in the hands of Japan's current most dangerous villains. Tsukuji, in turn, had jotted down the mumbled name, and then seen to helping with evacuation search and rescue, as well as cleaning up the aftermath of All Might's fight with the villain behind Shigaraki in the League of Villains, all for one or something. Later, the police had run with the information given, taking it and running it through various databases. Anything they could dig up on Midori Izuku was valuable. He'd had no identity for almost an entire year, just captured villains grinning smugly and muttering one single word that proved his existence in threat level, Deku. There's not a lot the police can do with just a villain name, so since the teen had debuted in his own way of offering pro-hero weaknesses to villains asking, they hadn't been able to do anything. There's not much to search with a made-up name, and no telling damning information, not even a quirk to work with. The first they'd even seen Deku was at the USJ, and Shota was really the only one to get a decent look at him before he was gone. And even with that, he didn't quite manage anything useful when he'd glanced over between villains challenging him, dark hair, an inky green, or perhaps even black, dress nice, sharp waistcoat and tie combo, with obvious lack of intention on joining the fight, maybe freckles, short, scrawny, and lean. He could tell the villain was young, but couldn't pinpoint anything past that, under twenty, at least. It honestly probably should have been looked into further, when Shota thinks about it. They'd had no information on him whatsoever, and then suddenly they had a civilian identity, courtesy of Bakugo Kotsky. How had he gotten so much after just three days of being captive? They hadn't thought to question Bakugo further. He'd have been taken to the hospital and released to his parents after his statement had been taken. Shota hadn't even seen the kid again until he was going house to house and asking parents and guardians to trust UA enough to allow their children into the dormitory program. They should have been smarter. They should have thought it through more. They should have thought, even if just for a second, about how Bakugo had known Deku's name. That's not the kind of information a villain would share with their captive, especially one like Deku who kept in the shadows. Deku kept himself out of the public eye, with nothing but the villain's name, Deku, being spoken of. Other villains took his proffered information and did his dirty work. So, how had Bakugo known? Unless there was more to this... There's a couch in the room, and an armchair that showed a positions to face the two teenagers. The conference table is there, too, but he doesn't bother using it. There's only the three of them, and he doesn't want too much space between them. The two boys perch on either side of the couch, Midorius curled in tight like he had been at the police station. 
while Bakugo is gritting his teeth and glaring off to the side. Shota tries to carry his uninterested air, but he knows he looks more perplexed than he'd like. Which one of you wants to start? Shota draws, hoping it comes off uninterested. Neither boy says a thing. Midori's eyes flick nervously to Shota, and then Bakugo, then down to his lab where he's tugging at his fingers, and Bakugo just clenches his teeth harder. Shota worries for a second the blonde might break a tooth. Midoriya. Shota bites back a sigh, selecting the one he thinks will break first. He's had no trouble explaining things thus far, so Shota hopes it continues. How do you know Bakugo? The teen startles at being spoken to, nervous eyes glancing up. We, um, we're classmates. I got that. Shota huffs, trying not to get annoyed at the dancing around the subject. How else? Unless you're telling me that you and Bakugo are just classmates in your reality, which seems odd, considering the display I've just witnessed in class. I doubt that's all you two are. I believed you thus far. I hope you're not lying to me now, Midoriya. I, I'm not, Midoriya yelps hurriedly. He takes a second to compose himself after the outburst, rubbing anxiously at the back of his neck. We are classmates. Like I said, it's just... We, um... We've known each other since we were little. In my reality, my mom and... And auntie, I, um... I mean, Bakugo-san, have always been friends. Since, uh... Since we were born, at least. Huh. Shota lets that sink in before glancing at Bakugo, whose eyes are narrowed. Not at anything in particular. Shota clears his throat and Bakugo's eyes flick towards him. And you... Ditto. Shota narrows his eyes. And you didn't think that was an important piece of information to share when you found out Deku's identity. There was a motive behind your kidnapping Bakugo. You should have told us. Bakugo grits his teeth again, pointedly looking away from Shota. The man shuts his eyes, in an attempt to calm himself down and not lash out at the teenager before him, blinking his eyes open and looking back at Midoriya. What else? We... The teen swallows. We've always gone to school together. Elementary, junior high. I... I don't know, I've always looked up to Kachan. He's got a strong quirk, even though he wasn't always... Um... Nice. I always knew he'd be a good hero. How can you still say that? After everything I did to you? Bakugo turns abruptly to Midoriya. You said you didn't get a quirk until the entrance exam. That means you were still quirkless when we were in school, and I still... How the hell can you look at me now and say bullshit like that? It's not bullshit, Kachan. Midoriya rolls his eyes, like he's used to this. It's the truth. You're a good hero. Aizawa sensei wouldn't have kept you in his class if you didn't have potential, and we both know that. I always knew you'd be a great hero. I'm a fucking asshole. I tormented you. You let me torment you. I said... I said shitty things to you, and you still call me that? You still believe that I... You still look at me like... I don't understand. Deku hates me, and for good fucking reason. Deku... Deku turned into a villain after I... After... Why the hell didn't you? Shota suddenly feels like he's no longer on the same wavelength as the two teenagers. After what, Kachan? Midoriya snarls, and it's the most emotion Shota's seen from the kid. In the negative, at least. His eyes are narrowed, challenging. After you told me to take a swan dive off a tall building and hope for a quirk in my next life. Shota's body tenses as those words register. What? Yes. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It happened to you, too. I said that stupid fucking bullshit to you in both realities. The blonde roars, turning completely towards Midoriya and, grabbing fistfuls of his uniform once again, showed a jolts to tear them apart, but pauses just as fast when... And you did! I... What? Midoriya breathes out, staring wide-eyed down at Bakugo. You did it! Bakugo's head is ducked, almost pressing between where his hands hold a bone-white grip on Midoriya's uniform. You fucking did it, Izuku. Shit, you... You left a stupid fucking suicide note under your stupid fucking red shoes on the ledge of that shitty bridge in the outskirts of town. They didn't care. The cops, heroes, they didn't even care enough to try and fish your body. They didn't try to find you. Not when you first went missing, and not when your note and shoes were found. You were dead. Pronounced dead. I thought you really did it, you jackass. But I'm not... He's not... Yeah. Bakugo scoffs, finally shoving Midori away. No shit. Imagine my fucking surprise to come face to face with a dead guy. I went to your funeral. I was there with my mom consoling your mother after the service. You had some fucking nerve, Midoriya. You have no idea what that did to her. M mom Bakugo gives a tight nod. 
She was never the same after the cops showed up and told her what you'd done. What everyone thought you'd done. She wouldn't eat, wouldn't get out of bed. All she wanted to do was sleep. My mom had her admitted to the psych ward and she hasn't made any improvements. You were her entire fucking life and you just... You gave it up. Gave her up. Also, you could go play villain. And you didn't even care. You didn't even ask her about it. I... I would never. You're not Deku, Midoriya. Shota feels the need to remind. His head is spinning just listening to this. But he knows he can't let Midoriya spiral for something he didn't do. Bakugo, this is not your Midoriya Izuku. I know, the blonde spits, glaring at his teacher. You wanted an explanation. Well, here it is, Sensei. I'm a piece of shit. Deku faked his own suicide and I believed he actually did it because I told him to. I've thought for months, almost a year, that he was dead. That it was my fault he died because I told the bastard to do it and he did. It's all my fault. Expel me. Arrest me. I don't know. Kachan, Midoriya frowns. Listen. Makako manages out, voice tight with barely contained emotion as he turns towards Midoriya. I didn't mean it. I really didn't fucking mean it. I was stupid and an asshole, and you were an easy target. I just said it. I, I didn't think... I didn't mean for you to... I didn't think you'd... Fuck, Izuku, I'm sorry. I don't blame you, Midoriya whispers. I never did. I was... I was more annoyed when you told me to. Honest. That day... That day you went a little hard on my analysis book, too. I was more upset about that. My copy of my reality is still waterlogged and burned. I had to rewrite the whole thing, and it was super annoying. I only keep it for All Might's signature now. The green-haired teen pauses, seeming to notice he'd strayed from the topic. He sucks in a breath, catching Bakugo's eyes again. I... I know you didn't mean it. I knew then. You were always a jerk, but you'd never gone that far. I knew it was more a show for your friends than anything else. If you meant it, you would have said it when we were alone. It hurt. A lot to hear. But I think that was the point I realized you wouldn't ever be my friend again. But I wouldn't jump just because you told me to. But you did. Bakugo wrinkles his nose. You went missing for two days. And that note showed up. We thought you were dead. I thought you were dead. I thought you killed yourself because of me, Izuku. It wasn't you, Midoriya sighs, out with a shake of his head. Uh, or it wasn't you in my reality. I don't know what happened to your Midori, Izuku, but if he's anything like I was... A comment from you wouldn't have made him do anything drastic. I... I mean... I thought about it. For like a second after. But... But I wouldn't. There's mom to think about. And being a hero. And... And things started turning around for me that day. You know, you always said I couldn't be a hero. And some part of me really wanted to prove you wrong, too. That might be why you're always so testy in class. Well, consider me proven wrong. Even if it's not your Bakugo Kotsky, it's one of them. Bakugo draws. The corners of his lips twitching up faintly. Since they said we're in the same class, in your world at least, that means you really did get into UA, even after we all... In our junior high, Sensei. That's really cool, Izuku. It was always your dream. Yeah, Midoriya laughs, rubbing the back of his neck in embarrassment. You hate it, but I don't think you hate me anymore. We're getting better at working together. I'm pretty sure you tried to kill me on the first day of school, and I saw what Sensei was the only reason you didn't. We can work together now without trying to kill each other. Nothing like that's happened since the battle trials on the second day of school. Uh, yeah. Bakugo raises an eyebrow, glancing back at Shota. The man himself can only shrug. Probably something else that'll give him a migraine and a heart attack simultaneously. He really should send hate mail for Midoriya's Aizawa Shota back with the kid. Maybe that'll be the kick in the ass the other Aizawa needs to get his shit together and help this child. That all sounds about right, though. Bakugo snuffs. So analysis is a universal Midoriya trait, then, huh? Midoriya shrugs. I've never stopped, no matter what you or anyone else said. It's useful. And dangerous, Shota asked casually. Both boys startled, like they'd forgotten he was in the room with them. I have a lot of questions, and we're going to be having a nice long chat later, both of you. Especially you, Bakugo. Midoriya winces, but Bakugo just steals himself, like he's prepared for the worst. You can't expel him, Sensei, the green-haired teen whispers. Oh, Shota cocks his head to the side. Consequences are definitely in order from what he's heard, but he'd yet to decide if expulsion's the way to go. There's a lot to consider, but he can't just ignore something like this. And why not? I... I know what he did was bad, but he's not a villain. He will make a good hero. He's a good person. You, you can't punish him for something that happened so long ago, for something he did before he matured. I... I'm sure he's already been punishing himself. Don't defend me, 
Bakugo scoffs. I deserve consequences. If Sensei wants to expel me, so be it. If I'm arrested, I deserve it. I was a dick to you, and I deserve a punishment for that. That's so harsh for something you did as a kid. I was 14 years old, Izuku. I knew better. You didn't, though. Midoriya shakes his head. No one ever stopped you. Seriously, Sensei, the teachers didn't care. I know enough now to believe that Deku and I grew up the same way. S something changed, but it wasn't that. And, and I know you're underground, so you've seen... And you also have a less than ideal quirk, even if it's super cool. You... You know discrimination. Quirk discrimination is awful, but... But quirkless discrimination is worse, and people don't care. Shota stays quiet as Midoriya clenches his fists. I know what Katan did was bad, but his whole future shouldn't be ruined because he made one dumb comment to a quirkless kid when he never got reprimanded once since we were little kids. He should have known better, sure, but that doesn't mean that he did. That doesn't mean anyone actually told him what he was doing was wrong. B besides, you decided yourself he had potential. I determined his potential before I had all the facts. Shota tells the teen slowly, then he reminds, as if Midoriya didn't already know. What Bakugo did was suicide baiting. And you and I both know it was more than one. Bakugo grits out. I may not have told you to take a swan dive, but I did bully you. Y you Midoriya points a finger at Bakugo. Shut up! I'm trying to plead your case here. And Sensei, I really do know. It was wrong of him, and he, he really shouldn't have said it. Trust me, I know what he did, and how wrong it was. But I never t took him seriously, and I doubt Deku did either. Midoriya draws in an almost shaky breath. I just don't think he should get expelled over it. He's changed. I can see that now. My Katan's changed. He grew up, and he's not the same kid who told me to jump off a roof. The Katan who told me to jump off a roof would never have apologized to me. But he did just now. You did. You're not that person anymore, Katsuki. Shota has a sick feeling, again, that this is yet another thing that Midoriya's Aizawa doesn't know about. Something else that clearly affected this child's life, whether for the better or for the worse, and he doesn't know. Bakugo had tormented Midoriya, had said unspeakable things, and yet they're still in class together. He apparently still pairs them together, from what he's gathered from Midoriya. He... he shouldn't get off free. I agree he deserves a punishment of some kind for what he did. You don't learn from your mistakes if you're not taught their mistakes. Midoriya shakes his head, hands now gripping the fabric of his uniform pants. But he shouldn't be expelled. What he did was wrong, but it really shouldn't end his career as a hero before he's even had a chance to start. I've worked with Katan in class. I know this is where he belongs, Sensei. Shota leans back in his chair and watches the two boys. He searches Midoriya first, for any dishonesty. It doesn't make much sense. He knows only what the teen has said about his own relationship with his own reality's Bakugo Katsuki thus far, and he can't say it's very positive. He still can't help but look for some sort of power imbalance between the two, Midoriya feeling like he has to please Bakugo for whatever reason, but he doesn't spot anything of the sort. He tries to locate anything that could be a reason he'd vouch so seriously for the bully who'd apparently suicide-baited him. He doesn't find anything past the determined fire alit in green eyes. He's starting to think this is just Midoriya's personality. He wonders what the hell had to have happened to Deku to change him into the villain he is now. They're just so different. But they'd started out the same, according to what Midoriya has pieced together and what Bakugo has confirmed of Deku. When he turns his prying eyes onto Bakugo, they narrow in thought. Bakugo is watching Midoriya, expression wavering between confusion and exasperation. There's a distant fondness buried in his gaze, too, and Shota can only imagine Deku was at some point just like Midoriya. It's obvious. These two did know each other prior to Deku's apparent suicide, which he will be talking to Suguchi about because what the fuck? Did he not think it was useful to inform everyone that the villain they're after is a presumed dead, quirkless kid? Shota shakes his head, lifting a hand to drag through his hair. The action draws in both teenagers' gazes. You won't be expelled, he decides tightly. Midoriya shoots him a thankful grin, while Bakugo's shoulder slumps slightly like he'd been prepared to shoulder through an expulsion lecture. Midoriya has pleaded your case. Knowing what I do now of your and Deku's relationship, I doubt he's done with you. You're safest here. Shota pauses, looking between the two, picking their expressions apart minutely. He heaves a sigh, rubbing at his eyes. I've seen the changes in your character since the start of the year as well. It's obvious you are not the same hot-headed brat who threw that baseball on the first day of school. That doesn't change what you've done, the harm you've caused, whether meaning to or not. But your attitude and willingness to accept blame and punishment now has opened doors for change and redemption. 
Thank you, Sensei. Bakugo bows his head despite the fists settled on his thighs. That said, Shota clicks his tongue. You will be getting consequences for your actions. What you did was wrong. What you say always has a chance of hurting deeper than you can know, which is why you need to do better. You want to be a hero. A hero doesn't aim to hurt someone, and it's unacceptable that you have. Discrimination is not a good trait for a hero to have, and we will be working on that now that it's been brought to my attention. Now... I assume I don't need to tell you that if I ever hear of you saying anything of the sort again, it'll be an automatic expulsion. Yes, Sensei. Bakugo mutters dutifully. Good. Shota continues as if the teen hadn't said a word. Now, you'll be on house arrest for one week, in which time I will be assigning you chores and essays on quirklessness and discrimination that will ideally expand your field of view. You will have those completed by the time your arrest is finished. Half ass your work and we'll start from square one, got it? It'll be your time you're wasting if you don't put an effort in to be better. I got it. Bakugo snaps. Shota doesn't take it to heart. That's an overwhelmed snap, not a blatant anger one. In addition, Shota narrows his eyes. You're going to be having mandatory bi-weekly visits with Hound Dog. This is not a punishment. It's for your well-being and it's not up for debate any longer. You refused this when I suggested it at the beginning of the year, but I will not back down a second time. A good hero will not resort to anger in the way you tend to do. You'll end up like Endeavor and the world doesn't need two of him. There's nothing wrong with needing some help dealing with things, Bakugo. The suicide, feigned or not, of a childhood friend is traumatic. Being kidnapped is traumatic. Bakugo looks like he wants to fight it again. But then the boy pauses before he says anything and glances to the side where Midoriya is glancing between the two of them. The blonde grits his teeth again, crossed his arms tightly across his chest, and slumps back into the couch. Fine. Shota gives a satisfied nod before glancing back at Midoriya. Ideally, I'd be putting you into counseling as well. What I've heard so far is troubling, problem child. It's a lot to shoulder alone. And if it weren't for your unique situation, I'd insist. I'd ask if you've seen anyone about this in your reality, but I'm starting to question your Aizawa's competence. Midoriya let out a startled snort of laughter. Mr. Aizawa's a good teacher, too. He's doing the best he can. The teen shrugs before quieting and hesitating. He doesn't know, so you can't blame him. You should tell him. Shota scratches at his head. We can't help you if we don't know what's going on. I can't help you where you're from. I can only make changes here. If he's anything like me, Midoriya, he'd want to know so he can improve your learning environment. For both of you. Sounds like you've both struggled with your past and present together. M maybe the child shrugs, hunching his shoulders up to his ears as a defense. Shota supposes it's better than a straight-up no. It's not like he can force the kid into anything, and he can't pass the message on either. He'll have to put his trust in the fact Midoriya seems like he has a good head on his shoulders. All right, Shota sighs. House arrest will start tomorrow. Normally I would make you catch up on everything you miss by yourself, as part of the punishment. But you can have today to get a head start on gathering the classwork being assigned over the week you're out. I doubt any of the other teachers will have a problem giving you the work you'll be missing. It's up to you, though. Wow, Midoriya grins. That's so nice. When you gave us house arrest after the preliminary hero license exam, you didn't let us do that. We had to catch up all on our own. You were really mad, though. Shota blinks, eyeing the teenager. He hasn't had to put anyone in house arrest yet, but it's really not surprising that in Midoriya's universe, both he and Bakugo were probably the first. Huh? Bakugo cocks an eyebrow. What are you on about? Oh, Midoriya laughs to himself, sniggering behind his hand. Right, um, we fought after the exam, and Sensei caught us. I'm sure we would have had it worse if All Might wasn't there to cover for us, but, um, Sensei was unimpressed. Bakugo blinks. All Might? I'm sensing a theme here with you and your Aizawa not knowing things that are clearly important. Shota sighs heavily, waving a dismissive hand in Bakugo's direction. Do I even want to know what that was about, problem child? Uh, Midoriya shakes his head until his curls are covering his eyes. Probably not, Sensei. It wouldn't make much sense here anyways. Bakugo is glancing at Shota now, an eyebrow cocked in confusion. Shota waves him off a second time. He doesn't have the time, nor the patience to explain the alternate reality can of worms to Bakugo right now. Okay, then. The man draws with a sigh. Second period will be starting soon, and I have to teach the third years. Bakugo, you know where you're going, and I suggest you take today to get yourself ready. You'll need it, Midoriya offers helpfully. A week is a long time. Yeah, yeah. The ashy-haired teen hops, already standing up. He glances back at Midoriya. Can we talk later? 
Um, Midoriya bites his bottom lip and glances at Shota, clearly questioning. We'll see. Shota leans forward, exhaustion creeping up on him. He doesn't know how he's going to get through the rest of the day, which includes introducing Midoriya to two more classes of heroes in training. Now, get to class before you're assigned more punishments for tardiness. Bakiko grits his teeth, but arches into a bow anyways. Yes, Sensei. Thank you, Sensei. Have a good day, Kachan, Midoriya calls as Bakiko walks stiffly to the door. The ashen-haired teen pauses, glancing back. He glares a lesser glare than Shota's used to seeing before cocking his head in response. Yeah, you too. Try not to get yourself killed here. And then the kid's gone. Shota raises an eyebrow at his departure, glancing over at Midoriya. He's not expecting to see the kid grinning widely. Kachan's so nice here. He really is very different to my Kachan-sensei. I don't think he'll have quite as many problems as my sensei does. How that is nice? Shota will never know. Midoriya really is a complex puzzle that he needs to solve. He is going to make it his mission, and he'll find a way to report back to his reality, so that Aizawa Shota over there gets his head out of his ass and actually notices the kid. Right. He offers dryly. Well, come on. Class will be starting soon, and it won't be a good example if we show up late. You'll be sitting at my desk for second and third period since both classes are full. I don't have anything for you to work on today, but I can ask the first-year teachers to make extra copies of their assignments, if you'd like. Thank you, Midoriya bows his head, standing up after Shota and following him to the door. I don't know if time is passing in my reality, but I don't want to fall behind, and there's no harm in getting ahead if it's not, right? Why does that not surprise him? Isolated in a reality that's not his own, and he's worried about falling behind in his own classes. There's really no doubt. Midoriya Izuku is a problem child to the fullest extent. All right, listeners, this concludes Chapter 3 of When Realities Collide. Chapter 4 will be next. Eager to hear your thoughts and reactions to this chapter as well. And as always, thank you so much for listening.